For those of you who don't know, I'm Chris Bedford. I'm the still somewhat new director of the Baltimore Museum of Art, and this is a, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is my first uh, print fair, and um, my enthusiasm for it has been built up by our very dutiful curatorial staff who have told me that this is a unique event in Baltimore and beyond. So I am coming here on Sunday. I'm bringing my wallet, so we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what kind of bad things happen as a consequence of that. Um, so, first of all, I want to thank the Print Drawing and Photography Society for sponsoring this terrific event. I'm looking forward to it this evening. And uh, for those of you unfamiliar with our various different friends groups at the museum, the Print Drawing and Photograph Society is one of just five and we rely on them very heavily to sponsor our events, our mission at the institution. They're responsible for collecting, they're responsible for uh, collection presentations and for exhibitions too, so we're infinitely grateful to them for their support. So for any of you present, thank you so much. So uh, prints, drawings and photographs became a very quick preoccupation for me uh, since I arrived at the BMA. And I think one of, the, one of the chief emphases for any director of a museum is to determine some sort of strategy that differentiates you from all other museums. So one thing I'll say about the BMA is that we have 98,000 objects in our collection, and 65,000 of those are works on paper falling into those three different categories. We have um, extraordinary curators, we have an extraordinary collection, and we have a not so extraordinary space to show that collection. Uh, you'll notice that if you walk through the museum, if and you go to the third floor of the contemporary wing, so the most remote part from you in the museum, the most difficult to find and the least notable, that's where we show the greatest portion of our collection. So we're, one of our great emphases in the coming years is to remedy that fact and allow the citizens of Baltimore as well as Hopkins students, other college students, to learn directly from our extraordinary collection of prints, drawings, and photographs. So the more we can do to draw attention to the richness of those holdings, um, the better. And this evening, I think, is a big part of that. Um, let's see, what else do I have to say here? A lot. My, my principal task here is to, is to welcome two key people to the stage. And uh, the first of whom is James Siena, who is here um, as a consequence of the industry of our staff, principally, and Schaefer, who organizes this great event. And uh, James was kind enough to design a print, which has become the signature uh, for this print fair and actually adorns my office at present. Uh, is a stunning work, and we're very grateful to that, to him for that. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, and I'm assuming everybody in here does, uh, Jameson is an extraordinary artist and makes very intimate patterned abstractions that um, allow us to, I think, really see and experience work in a direct fashion. And uh, is also something of a local boy in that he grew up in Washington, D.C. and, and uh, holds a BFA from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He's widely, widely collected, and that should come as no surprise to anyone. His work is held in um, collections ranging from the Met to MoMA to the Whitney to the MFA in Boston, and of course the BMA. And his first solo exhibition in the United States across all media happened in 2003, and that was at the San Francisco uh, Art Institute Gallery. So it's a great privilege to have James here. I'm looking forward to hearing everything he has to say. And I'm uh, placing the onus on our curator, here this evening, and Schaefer, to draw out the, the best version of James, as well as our curatorial assistant, uh, Morgan Doughty. So I'm, I'm very honored to welcome them, and I'm keen to hear them speak. So uh, please help me welcome them. I think they're backstage, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Can I hear you? Can I hear me? Yes. Can you hear yeah, me? Okay, good. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you all for coming. This is my favorite event that we do. It's, it's uh, more fun than a... There goes the mic. <laughs> I dropped the mic. <laughs> my, ooh, my favorite event. It obviously still works. That's okay, good. this is going to be good. All right, so um, we invited James to come down because uh, not only does he make amazing paintings and sculpture and all sorts of other things, but he's an um, incredibly 
uh, invested printmaker across yes. all techniques and has worked with many shops, many of whom are sitting in the audience. So we're going to dig into the prints. But before we do, I wanted to do a little housekeeping. Um, I want to thank Chris for introducing us and for uh, allowing the print fair to continue on, even though he wasn't sure at first what it was all about. And also uh, to the curatorial staff, Jay Fisher is our chief curator, and Rena Hoisington is the head of our department um, for their support. And also a huge shout out and thank you to Morgan Dowdy, who is just an unbelievably smart and consummate assistant to the department. And all the details of this weekend have passed through her able, nimble typing finger. She types faster than I've ever, I can't, it's hard to even imagine. Also, I need to thank uh, PDPS, the Print Drawing and Photograph Society, for helping to present the print fair and also for sponsoring this talk, as Chris told you. Um, it's uh, uh, one of, I think, their favorite events as well. So we're happy to have all you PDPSers in the audience. Um, and a special shout out to the president, Francine Krumholtz, and the vice president, uh, Susie Hill, and then we have two co-chairs that run the print fair uh, details uh, from their end, Karen Fowler and Betsy Cumming. So thank you to all of you for your hard work. And also a quick personal shout out to Judy Katz who placed stickers on things and stuffed things in lanyards and did all manner of things to help us get ready for this week. It's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of stuff. All right, so. Also wanted to say that the print fair is open Saturday 10 to 8 and Sunday 10 to 5, so you'll have time to make decisions and break out those checkbooks. Also, uh, you should know that there's a sister fair going on in town at Open Space. It's called the Publication and Multiples Fair. It's their eighth annual fair. Uh, it's different than ours in that it's a tabletop fair. They have 150 <laughs> vendors and um, it, some solo artist tables and some group tables, um, and very reasonable and worth checking out, also free to the public. Okay, that was it, I think. All right, so if your phone is on, can you put, turn it off? Thank you. And also to say, we're gonna talk for an hour, and then afterwards, Morgan is gonna have a handheld mic if we wanna ask a few questions uh, for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll cut it off after that. Okay, so let's see. So as Chris said, James, uh, embarked on a huge favor to us, which was to design a poster for the print fair. And this is him working on it. Uh, we were doing some color tests down at the Baltimore Print Studios with Kyle Van Horn and Kim Bentley, who some of you know, I'm sure, um, which was great fun. And the poster came out beautifully. Um, this is it in process, two colors on the left and three colors on the right uh, before the black line went down. So four color pulled through the screen. It's quite elaborate. So here it is. And it, there's some secret funny things in there. You have to kind of wander around and find them. There's an extra print shop there that you might uh, recognize who we hope would come but didn't, had busy things. They've been known to meddle in things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also <clears throat> to note that the poster is on sale in the shop. Uh, it's a very reasonable James, James Sienna original, so you should run downstairs and get it. In fact, the shop is staying open late for us tonight after the talk, in case you have a mind to do that. Okay, so. Yes. Uh, so, hmm. thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm, it's, I've been waiting for 13 months to come down here. <laughs> Initially, I thought she was inviting me for March 30th, 2016, and I, I kind of rearranged my schedule, and she said, no, it's a year from now. <laughs> of course it is. You're, you know. I like to plan ahead. Everything I'm runs grateful. on, you know, you have to have deadlines to, like, make everything happen, and so when things go to publication here, you know, you have to have your no, facts No, it's museum straight, time. Right? Museum it's time museum. is a whole exactly. other kind of time. Museum time. Rather than art gallery time. Right, exactly. Right. So James makes uh, paintings. I think that's, was that where you started, would you say? That seems it's to be. Funny you should say that. I did a lot of printmaking in college. In fact, I did engravings in college. I don't even know why I did engravings in college. I don't really remember doing them that <laughs> well because it was such a long time ago and there was uh, marijuana involved somehow. <laughs> but. Um, I, I didn't want to work on, on zinc like everybody was told to at Cornell. And so I, I was 
kind of a maverick renegade bad boy in college. And so printmaking was very important to me. Peter Kahn was teaching there. He's, some of you, most of you, probably all of you know who Wolf Kahn is. And Peter Kahn was, was Wolf's brother uh, and taught at Cornell. And he taught in the art history department. And he taught techniques and materials classes and the history of techniques and materials. So while I still tried to be contemporary, I've, I've, and I've, I've always loved um, respect for materials. So to make a long story less long, I didn't want to work on zinc. I wanted to work on copper. I saw Jim Dine's print retrospective in 1977, came to the Johnson Museum, and he was working on roofer's copper. Mm -hmm. You know, the way Jim Dine starts a plate sometimes is the printmaker gives him a pristine copper plate, and he flips it over and throws it on the floor, and then he gets, starts working on it. It makes a little noise. Yeah, it puts a little, that's right, visual noise. So I got some roofer's copper, which was $2 a square foot in those days. And I also bought some uh, type high um, f printing blocks from a, from a, from, uh, that had been used in newspaper printing. I had half tone prints on one side, but they were copper. So I pried them off the type high blocks and flipped them over and filed them down and was able, I had nice thick copper. And did Peter teach you how to engrave with the beer? I don't, I don't remember. I guess he did. Huh. Or, yeah. Cool. In any case. So, it was, so I, did, I really did a lot of printmaking, and I did not make that many paintings. And so this painting that you're seeing here, roundabout, became not so uh, contemporary in terms, I mean, not so old-fashioned in terms of material. Peter taught us all how to make our own paint, so I made a lot of handmade painting, paint, paintings, which were very, very fragile. And when I started showing them, they would always come back to the studio damaged. So I had to repaint a lot of them. And at one point, I just, I was in a scrapyard with the sculptor Alan Serrett and uh, looking at metal. And he said, isn't this cool? Let's look at, you know, we smoked pot, look, walked around the scrapyard. And, and I found this slab of metal, two slabs of metal that were exactly the same size as this piece here. Uh, and I made paintings on them, and I, I haven't changed the size ever since. I've been using the same proportion since about 1991. And still aluminum slabs. Still aluminum, and I buy what's now called pedigreed metal. I know what the alloy is of aluminum, and, uh, and I, it's, it's med better made. and you know. And I've, and I've learned how to prime the surface. And one shot sign painter's enamel is enormously durable. And that's why I settled on it. I, I feel I always look at them and think, you know, if I flick my fingernails, if I catch something, will it just pop right off? But you get it to s stick somehow. Well, I use auto body primer. I use metal primer. Okay. And sand it to a nice smooth finish. And, oh, it's, uh, the, the paintings are remarkably durable. So what James does is um, decides on a kind of a set of rules to start with. So these are, are these nesting loops? These are nesting loops. And so you'll find what, as we look through that they're usually an all over composition like this that has some kind of, you know, I'm going to do this one thing as long as I can do it on this specific surface without bouncing out of the edge, right? Right, it's a bounded, a bounded. Uh, surface. And so the edge becomes really important to you, the sort of push and pull against that boundary, I think. And, the, and compression. And the compression, yeah. So that when you get to the prints and you, you have these borders, it kind of plays with that idea because you're not really to the edge, sort of. Oh, I'm not? Well, <laughs> well, we'll see. Well, let's well, keep going. Yeah, let's okay. look at it now. <laughs> uh, and you've been making sculpture. I've been making sculpture. Uh, well, actually, I've been making sculpture since the 80s. And what this slide shows, well, at least the front two sculptures that you're seeing, which are much smaller than the one in the back. The one in the back is about six feet long, diagonally, I guess you could say. And the two foreground sculptures are casts of of uh, 3D prints, of scans, of little hand-held or hand-sized toothpick sculptures that were built around dried grape stems. And I used to make those 
in the 80s when I didn't have a market or a gallery or a reputation or anything, and I would give them away at, at Christmas time to people. And, um, and they were all destroyed by cats. <laughs> Because they were made with milk glue, and the cats would sort of sniff them and start licking them and then eat them, right. basically. So I started making them again a few years ago, and then I had an injury in November of uh, 2012 that damaged my right wrist for a few months, and so I, I could make sculpture a little more easily than draw or paint. So I made that show. Oh, what a surprise. So when uh, Morgan and I went up to see James at his studio, I guess it was during print week, during the IFPDA fair, and I snapped this in his studio, and he said, promise me you won't post anything. But, you know, he didn't say anything about tonight, so. But I was fascinated that things are starting to, like, crawl out of the, the interior, and then now the sculpture is starting to, like, it's becoming a sculpture, this transition between 2D and 3D. It is, yeah, that's the only one of those so far. Um, I, I've, I did a group of drawings in, that in the last show that, that happened in January uh, that I called Wanderers, where the drawings started to wander off of the page and onto the mat of the, uh, of the frame. And I thought, well, let's just keep on wandering. Keep going. And I came out of the side. And I, who knows where that will go. So I wanted to ask you about your influences. As I was reading all the various things written about you, people invoke all kinds of people like LeWitt, the sort of obvious Richard Tuttle. But you mentioned at some point Ava Hess. Did you not? I did. You did. And I wanted to plug our far away on paper space on the third floor of the Contemporary Wing where all four of our Ava Hess drawings are up at the moment. So when you come back tomorrow, you'll have to wander up there. I will. Because they are beautiful. I will indeed. Well, there's a, some, there's a, it, I, it's, I have been told that my work has psychological implications or content. And far be it from me to say that it is, you know, uh, that it is so. Um, I'll leave it to other people to say that. But, but there is something about Hesse's relationship to the body and the self um, that I admire enormously, and the visceral, I think, is also a very important aspect. All right, now we're going to turn to some prints. This one's pretty early, 95. That's the first one I did. I took a long hiatus from printmaking from about 1979 to 1995 because I graduated from college and didn't have access to a press. And um, I moved to uh, 83 Canal Street, where my studio still is in 1989. And uh, subsequent to another injury, I hope I don't keep saying this, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, well, I, I moved to, to this building, and on the same floor uh, is a great <laughs> legendary uh, intaglio studio called Harlan and Weaver Intaglio. And I got to know Carolyn Felix quite well. and. Uh, I was, a, I was a picture framer to survive at the time, so I, I, I remember they needed uh, scraps of mat board, which I had plenty of. And when they found out about my injury, uh, I was confined to, to our sixth floor walk up for a couple of months with a broken hip. Uh, they said, hey, how about we give you some copper? And so I made a print called Recovery, which I then gave to people who were ferrying important staples like bottles of Guinness up to the sixth floor while I was recovering. <laughs> and I had dealt with this motif in the past. But, uh, right. So they did that as a favor to me, and a couple of years later we got involved more deeply. But I, this, I love this. This echoes a print that you'll see shortly, and which we put on view in the print fair galleries, which is No Man's Land, and the successive states that we got from oh, Felix great. and Carol yeah. uh -huh. several fairs ago, I forget which one. Um, but this, this sort of, the lines never touching, but they're sort of pulsing, and you think they're crossing, but they're not, and the whole thing just kind of starts zzzzing for your, you know, eyeballs. It's, they're incredible, love these. All right, let's talk about this one. Mm. Oh, I was just mentioning uh, 
the group that I did in 1997. And this is one of three prints uh, that were started by a benefactor who, um, who shall remain nameless because he backed out of the project halfway through, threatening my precious and delicate relationship with Carol and Felix, and I bought him out and, and paid them for the, for the addition, for the, for the three sets of 18 that we did. And, uh, and that, I, I, that's one of my favorite prints, actually. That's, I'm glad I kept it in the stack. James sent me a PowerPoint that was, I don't know, 700 megs or something. And it had 164 slides in it. And they were all prints. Like, I've added photographs that I've taken over, you know, the time I've known James. But this was just, you know, print after print. 164. I thought I only did 110 editions. Well, so. I don't think that's true. Okay. I stopped counting, I guess. <laughs> and I think there was one shop that, who wasn't represented in the deck. And I, for, I forget which one, but I mean, there were some things missing, so there's more than 164. Okay. FYI. That's the second one of the group, right? That's an open bite print. The one previous, can you go back a second? Yep. I just wanted mm -hmm. to mention that the reason those light blue tones are happening is that we, we kept resurfacing the plate with varnish and step biting. Um, right, and we were t proofing. Carol and Felix are consummate. Uh, testers of color and of and of depth of bite, and they have these in, incredible scopes that you can look down. You can look at a little etched line, and and they can actually kind of measure it. Felix will say, "I think it needs to be just a little bit deeper," and you do it while the varnish is still on. And so the last, the first, um, the darkest lines are maybe an hour, and the lightest lines are five minutes. That's, that's the same blue. It's the same blue. It's one blue. Wow. Yeah. It's blue on Chine Collet, too. And oh. They, were, they are masters of doing the Chine Collet. Yeah, so Chine they Collet. get that super fine line. Right. Chine Collet, for those of you who aren't printmakers, is when you print onto a thin piece of tissue that's then getting glued to the, a stronger piece of paper behind it. So you sometimes get a tonal shift with this tissue that the print is really on and then the white around it. Hey, whose phone is that? <laughs> Do you want, can you explain, like, this is a perfect example of one of your systems where you oh. split the rectangle in half and something else happens and onward? Yeah, it's, iterat it's an iterative grid, you could say. So you divide a grid in half, and in one of the two spaces remaining, divide that one in half. Uh, and in the next, and then in, a, in the one of those two spaces remaining, divide it in half. It's a little bit like that golden section geometry that everybody's seen, but that's done by, by drawing a line that, on a rectangle that leaves a square remaining. So that's where the Nautilus spiral and a lot of natural forms Fibonacci, of nature. Is that the Fibonacci, the Fibonacci sequence? sequence all right. kinds of things like that. Right. Uh, and this is done in a repeated manner. So you'll, uh, I'll do that inside. I'll do, I'll do four divisions and then draw rectangles inside each one of those and do that again and then draw rectangles in each side of those and do that again until you get smaller and smaller rectangles. And that cross, that sort of diagonal cross that happened, is just a density thing. It's a kind of emergent geometry. And you see a kind of shift of cross in there that has never happened in any of the paintings I've done hmm. using this motif. And I've done numerous yeah. ones. Huh. And this just kind of, it emerged. It was a big surprise to all of us. Do you feel like the, that the, the system that has you go on as long as you can with the space you're allotting yourself is more important to you? Is the journey more important than the final product? No, the product's more important. And do you know what you're going to get when you start? No. Okay. No. <laughs> I, I, love to, I love to work, but I love to finish things, too. I mean, <laughs> it can be, you know really fun to work and make the thing and it's wonderful to look at it while it's incomplete and it's a challenge and sometimes it's kind of a letdown when it's done but it usually means oh okay if I can do that then I can do this so then it, you know there's a kind of sequential situation all right so then here's a set of nine that they did in a portfolio uh, Carolyn Felix did which I, you had separate images of, but for space and time, I kept them all together. Sorry, they're not very big. How did you decide which? 
Well, those are just a group of my of motifs that I was interested in at the time. Uh, the upper left is, a, is uh, based on a group of things that I called base three or base paintings. There was a base two painting where I divided the surface into two, but I didn't do it drawing a straight line. I made a kind of cell. So I made it two cells. And then inside those two cells, I made two more cells. <laughs> and then I did it. And I just, it was, so it was basically symmetrical, but those slowly distortions happened until the final cells that were like little fat ones that were wider than they were tall, and there were ones that were taller than they were wide, just as a result of the vagaries of my hand. And I was allowing that kind of slippage to, to enter in to the thing. The one below that is also a, a, a motif that I was involved in a lot at, at that time, that having to do lattice. with a kind of, yeah, it's lattice. Yeah. It was, uh, I did a print with Carolyn Felix called Circulation that also involved a kind of regenerative algorithmic strategy for, for create, creating rectangles, but to using diagonals and crosses and intersections. And in that one, I was starting to distort the rectangle. So the, the initial X that starts the whole process was not even, I wasn't even trying to get the cross in the middle. I was really trying to push it down into one corner. Um, yeah, and the one on the lower right is the only engraving in that group. And that's that iterative grid thing, like the blue one you saw, Taste the Houses, but it's, I just took the volumes and just cut with the Buren, I was trying to get back into cutting with a Buren okay. again. Huh. Um, and I, I liked it. Yeah, it was, I was doing, I also was doing paintings with a lot of parallel lines like that too, hand-drawn parallel lines. All right, so this uh, line is sort of a character. Is it safe to say line is a character in your? Line and boundary. Now this slide is not telling the truth. It should, that the, the the edge is cropped yeah. all, on all four sides. So it has a border. It, those, all of those black things uh -huh. come to an end. It's one black shape on a white surface. Okay. It's just a very long perimeter. But is it one line? And you it's, a, just... it's an endless line that's filled in, yeah. Yeah. So if you were to do this in a painting, you would paint both the white and the black? Absolutely, yeah. And you would go over it how many times? I, I, these days I've been going over things more. Uh, in the old, old days, I kind of once or twice. Once or twice. Yeah. And yeah. now it's more? Now it's more. I, I, I think, well, there might be two reasons for that. One is I'm less satisfied than I was then, less stoned than I was then. I'm done. I'm done. I'm really done. <laughs> Promise? I, no, absolutely. It was, I had to quit because I smoked a lot of cigarettes. Um, I'm not against the noble weed for those who indulge. But uh, one shot sign painter's enamel has been, the, the formula has changed. Oh. So it's not quite as heavily pigmented as it was as well. So you have to go over to so get I have to go over the build-up. Oh, yeah. that's bad. Well, you end up with a better painting. I guess. And it just All takes right. longer. Ah. Oh, there's the one you're going to be showing. Uh, or do yeah. you have on view? Yeah. We put up the, we, several years ago we bought, um, Carol and Felix are really good about taking a, a proof of every stage as the plate develops. And so um, they came to the fair in 2012 and had on the wall the, you know, the first date through six and then the final. And so we purchased it for the collection with, um, I forget who's fun. It was the Friedberg Fund. Um, so we've installed them just because we haven't had a chance to yet, and why not? Because you're here. So in the fair, you'll see them on the wall when you first walk in. But they are, um, this one is, this is an example. Oh, I'm so glad you did that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to go, you know. They did this thing. Um, so this is a set of proofs that they also pulled in red ink. I don't know who has this set. Do you know? Ours is black. I don't know. I don't know. I have a set. Oh, lucky you. So you can say... <laughs> yeah, I feel, feel pretty lucky. Can you walk us through it? Well, I don't think I have to, oh, do okay. I? I mean, well, okay, yeah, upper left. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wow, is that the first one we printed? How interesting. Because it actually starts with four lines 
at orthogonal and orthogonal positions from a single point. So I remember I took little pieces of kneaded eraser, little tiny ones, and rolled them up and stuck them to the plate and looked at them and moved them around. And then I think I took a Sharpie and drew four lines around each one of those going like that. And, and just by eye, I tried to keep them semi-equal distant from each other, from the, uh, each other's nodes. And they're one, two, three, four, five nodes, right? One, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. yeah. And I would just double. So I did four, I would do eight, I would do 16, 32. And maybe then I just kind of went nuts and filled it all in till the end. I'm not <laughs> sure. And I'm, well, may, or I may have actually, they may have proved more, but only we decided because we'd done a larger version of this, which is called Upside Down Devil, and I think we only made one set of progressives or state. Well, states and progressives are the same, aren't they? In um, mm -hmm. in engraving, right? Yeah. Um, and then it was a very popular print. I wanted to try it again, uh, and and th we thought, well, let's really make this happen. You know, increasingly over the years, I've been trying to kind of let let the viewer into the process. Yeah. So we've we've done more state things, and and in fact, like the arrow prints that I did with uh, Island Press, who are here or will be here tomorrow. They're here. They're here. Hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't see you, but there I know they are. Um, it came out of and and desire to kind of make a guided uh, tour for the eye and okay. some. Uh, Things I've been doing. This, I, when you look at the final, of which there are two states on the bottom, one red, one black. Oh, um, that's it. Okay. Right. So ours is on the right, lower right, lower right. Um, but the, it's hard to sort of grasp where you would have. How could you possibly have started this, you know, thing? And so to see the generations, I think, is really useful for this one. But this, this is called No Man's Land, which for us, in terms of kind of digging into content and linking it to the, I, I, we think that you were looking at overhead shots of battlefields from World War I, is that right? Absolutely right. I have a very small collection <laughs> of aerial photos of trenches in World War I that I covet. Um, they're really beautiful and very tragic. Uh, and some of them you can actually see shells going off. And I remember scanning one and, and zooming in on my computer and you could see little helmets in the trenches. Yeah. They, were taken, they were taken to calculate artillery project, uh, you know, artillery distances and things like that. Right. And, um, and I'm a, kind of a fanatical student of war, being the son of a, a part-time warmonger. That's the DC connection. My father was a, um, a Pentagon official during two tours with Democratic presidents. And uh, so it, for a while, I really got into nuclear war and have all the books on nuclear war, and Herbert York's Race to Oblivion and all kinds of other books about that. And so I sort of worked my way back. And uh, I'm a firm believer of letting the world into one's work without being too explicit about it. Well, maybe until lately, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> but the, the, what's great about this is that it's, it's really an abstraction. Yeah, but it had to do with sort of lines advancing towards one another and kind of settling on a boundary because I didn't, that the, the white boundary between the five zones just happened because it happened. Because the line stopped. Because, oh yeah, there's a line, you can't go further. Right. All, every single line is independent of every other line in this print. And lucky for you, you didn't go zoom right through it. I didn't go zoom. No, <laughs> and I'm, I'm learning how to stop. <laughs> but all I could do at the time, it, it was really cut straight lines. I could start and stop. Right. And so I, I don't know if you have pictures of the later ones. Yeah, let's see what else we have. So this is That's the larger. That's upside down devil, the larger one. Yeah, yeah so the larger one. Yes, you do. This, this is, uh, these are loops, like going back to the first painting you showed. Mm -hmm. And what was challenging about this was I had to turn the plate while cutting. Well, some of you know that. Some, there are probably very good engravers in the audience who are going, listen to this piker. <laughs> but, but I was, you know, you, 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 I, I made one long line loop 
and then started putting doubling loops inside the zones, the, 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 inside that single zone until it, it, it's another doubling strategy. But every single one of those loops, I have to turn the plate 360 degrees and come in for a landing where I took off. That's a lot of curves in that That's puppy. That's a lot of curves, and there's some mistakes. Oh, boy, there's some, there's some <laughs> grinding and burnishing, and, but not that much. I, but if you look at the date, what does it say? Oh, yeah, 2005, 2009. At a certain point, I just got the heebie-jeebies, and I said, I can't, I'm going to make a mistake, oh. and I left it for a few years. Wow. I, don't, I, I don't think I've ever seen one where you're sort of shading, kind of... These are, this is one of my least popular prints. <laughs> and it's a, not too expensive either. <laughs> and I'm very happy with it. Yeah. I don't care what they say. It's, uh, <laughs> it went through many states. It's Chine Collet. It's, uh, it, it, it's, um, and it's a motif that I really enjoyed in painting and drawing. Yeah, this one and comes I did up a some, lot. And I did something very different with it than I did in painting or drawing. You know, I've, I've, it's, it's, it's too obvious to say, but I'll say it anyway, you know. I don't make prints because, you know, if you can't afford a drawing, that's, I'm against that. There, I said it. Okay, good. Let's get that out of the way. All right, so we've only hit one shop. We've got to keep moving here. Oh, yeah, all right, we've got to keep moving. Okay, we're on to paste prints. These are reduction linoleum cuts. Mm -hmm. Does everyone know what that means? Should we just... What happens with a reduction? The suicide method. Suicide print. Picasso was the first, right? Somebody out there? Oh, yes? Right. Katya says yes, so it's got to be Katya true. Katya knows no, it. We, we know, yeah. <laughs> he, well, his, his linoleum, because reduction linoleum cuts are magical, and I can't figure them out. Mine are more obvious, I think. Um, you just use the same block to print the print. So you print... Uh, uh, solid color, you remove some material, you print again. So where you remove the material, the color that you've printed remains, and so on and so forth. This makes my head hurt. It makes my head hurt, too. <laughs> I did a reduction silk screen last year that made everybody's head hurt. And I think I have that one in the back. Oh, good. And then I, I love these Yukioe ones that you did with Pace. Yeah, this was the one time I let the hand of another deal with the, the cutting. Oh, is that right? Yeah, well, I, that, he's better at it than I am. So I actually, there's a gouache that's smaller, and they scaled it up. Um, and what they, I think they scanned it, scaled it up, printed it on Japanese paper, and he went on doing it the way he does it. It's, you know, Yukioi involves laminating a thin sheet of paper to wood and actually cutting around the drawing. You know, that's how, you know, you would make a, Hokusai would make a painting on paper and mm -hmm. the painting would be destroyed. What's this, I forget this printer's name at Pace. That does, a Yasushibata. Yeah. He, and from doing these prints with me, he actually made some incredible reduction Yukioe prints. And I love them very, very much. Yeah. He did those Francesco Clemente prints too with the he did. Yukioe ones. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, it, I'm against reproduction, but what he does is something kind of beyond reproduction. It's a kind of collaborative mm -hmm. uh, interpretation. It's kind of like, you know, when a great violinist plays something. This yeah, is this another is one he did, one. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep moving. And that's a reduction lino that I did, that I cut. Um, sagging grids. Yes, well, that, that needs no explanation, does it? <laughs> All right. The, this I am fascinated by because the sort of sagginess of the last one and sort of the fallibility of your hand as you're drawing and letting your hand not use a ruler, you know, trying to get it to distort a little bit is not possible when you have, you know, these... Yeah, perhaps I misspoke. Six pieces well, of wood. No, I didn't really misspeak. I mean, I made a drawing that a cabinet maker then cut lengths of wood to, to assemble into a, a block. So all I did was the drawing and, oh, okay. and supervised the color proofing okay. in this. And it was a very elaborate, you know, 300-piece puzzle because of the, the highs and the lows. And, yeah. 
And then you added a screen print over the top of it with That's the arrows. That's the first instance that arrows made their way into my work. Yeah, oh. I wanted to give people a kind of route to walk through this, this uh, interlocking, this pair of, of uh, independent forms that are, that are interlocked. Uh, it came out of, it was, you know, this is the problem with having, uh, doing a one-hour talk on, a, I know, on an older moving. person. <laughs> no, no, it's, I, I, no, I started making comb paintings, and the combs just started inter, interlocking in more and more intricate ways until there were just finally two tines of a comb that were interlocking in some right, maniacal right. way. I think there's a comb in here somewhere. We'll see. So these are little... Are these well, the middle one on the top is kind of a comb. It's yeah. a sort of concentric comb, yeah. Right. And these were little, must have been slices of, from a These box were wood? some of the last boxwood apparently available for wood engravings. And we sourced it somehow from England. And they, they arrived, and the, they were just cuts off of a boxwood tree. And when they kiln dried it, sometimes they shrank and opened up. And we could have cut them up and assembled <laughs> little blocks. And I thought, well, this wood is so precious, let's just use all of it. So I made, uh, I made those things. And they're reduction as well. All right, so this is the book. This is, this is a book. Sequence one, which I have a easier, it's an accordion folded there. And then the whole sequence is right. separate and framed here. And Theo may be here. Yeah, is Theo here? In fact, I did this with Flying Horse Editions. <laughs> oh, there and, he is. Uh, Hi. Hey, Theo. Um, and I convinced Theo, I was a very demanding guy, and, I, and I, you know, we were having trouble getting the binding done. And, and the more I looked at this thing, I thought, I'd love to see this book all at once, but not as part of a book, but on a wall. And so part of our uh, deal was for me to get two unbound sets of the, of the pages. And so we showed them in a, can you go back? Yes. Yeah, we showed them in a kind of, Boustrophedonic installation. Rather than going left to right, left to right, left to right, we went left to right, right to left, left oh, to right. Got it. And uh, that's a word I like a lot. Uh, yeah, I use you're going to have to teach that one to me. After. It's, you know, I'll tell you right now. It's, <laughs> well, Boustrophedonic means as the plow follows the ox. Ah. And it, it, in fact, was the first way um, human writing was, was written. Yeah, it made perfect sense. You write to the end of the line, or you just write back to the other end. Aramaic was written that way. So this, in this... It's a two-sided yeah, book. Yeah, two-sided, so, so it, it, it unravels goes, on one, or ravels in one side. It ravels, and, and then, then unravels. unravels yeah. so on the other. Red, uh, black, black surrounds red up to page 18, and then on page 19, uh, red's... No, uh, page 17, and then page... 18, it flips to black surrounding, a red surrounding black, and undoes itself to right. red. All right, and then you started making some cast paper things with Dudenay. Yes. So this, I, there was a lot of these, and I put them all together. Lots of variations, although this is the complete, right? Yes. Yeah. What, what is, what's, what's, what's the logic there? Oh, boy. Okay. No, no, I can't. <laughs> No, they're, it's, they're equations, like, uh, and I, are we doing okay on time? Yeah, Jeez, well, I'm, time I know, flies. I know. Uh, I have a sort of synesthesia thing from my childhood. Uh, two is blue, three is red, four oh. is brown, five is yellow, six is purple, seven is green, eight is orange, and nine, I don't know what to call nine, but so red plus green. Red plus yellow is eight, orange. Got it. And two plus five is seven is green. So I made this kind of random chart and then started drawing lines between them. And then we took the we put the arrows in. We took the arrows out. You know, that's right. it was a lab residency. So I just did a lot of things. And most of these are unique. I don't think we additioned any of these. Oh, did you? Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, so. no. There's just three. To, wow. Yeah. Kept it really small. So um, it, I was watching a video of you and Chuck Close the other day talking about each other's work, which was oh, really... Oh, the Cornell it, talk. It yeah. was just really interesting. But he outed you as colorblind. Yes, he did. <laughs> Chuck loves to tease people. But you are, in fact, colored challenged, right? 
I am colored challenged, yes. I am, I, you know, I, I, I rub my eye. I, um, I'm, I'm, I, I have trouble with dark red, green, and brown, and, and also light red, green, and brown. Okay. I'm sort of, you know, well, there's so many reds and greens and browns. I mean, come on. It's true, there are many. And that, yeah, and then of course, as soon as I say that, people say, what color is this? What color is that? What color is that? <laughs> and, uh, but Chuck also says, he probably didn't that night, but he said one of the reasons he likes my color is because it's so strange. So it can be. And color, I mean, Chuck, Chuck has some incredible chroma vision. He has other challenges, but that's not one of them. He has other challenges, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which he manages pretty well. Yeah, I'll say. Yeah. All right, so pay, I love this little hook arrow piece. It's so sweet. Oh, it, kind of, and it comes in blue, too. FYI. Yeah, we did it in blue. We, we did, did it in blue. It in, and the, right, well, you can do that so easily. Well, you can do it with lots of things, but it's, it seems to lend itself very well to, to paper making. Yeah. And then um, these ones, there's color, is that frame, is there color on the outside of the frame? Is yes. that what's happening? Okay. The frame, I designed the frames. Okay. As a recovering picture framer, I still do lots of, <laughs> I design picture frames for my drawings and sometimes my prints. And so um, we, in, we cut a channel on the outside edge of the frame and inserted a pieces of Sintra, which is a kind of compressed uh, styrofoam, I think. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, the conservators out there. <laughs> <laughs> Tom knows. Um, and uh, and, and I, it, I, I'd made this stencil with the circles, but without the little tiny squares inside. Now, maybe you can't see the squares from where you are. The dots are squares. I squares. certainly can't. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I could. No, I can't. But uh, I remember Paul Wong. I, we were out of the country. Katya and I were traveling. and. I was writing to him about, you know, we've got to solve this stencil. I'm coming back in a couple of weeks. And, and Paul wrote, well, you know, I just don't know if that image is strong enough, James. Well, you know, I thought, <laughs> wow, okay, Paul, I got to think about this. And I, we made a date to get together, and, and I was agonizing about what to, what to do to make the image stronger. And I realized, what if I put a a square, exact same size squares at the center of each of the circles. And so we did. And Paul said, okay, now it's strong enough. All right. Nice. Okay. Then some lithographs. Are these your first lithographs with ULAE? Who's yes, since probably not college. Here yet, yeah. But it's coming. Yeah. That's the first one I did with Bill. Yeah. That's the second one. Second one. I don't know how many. Oh, look at that. Look at that touche. Tanagra. Boy. I didn't know what a Tanagra figure was. It was just the name of a house that we rented in the south of France that I liked. But now the Tanagra figures are Greek, uh, early Greek figures, aren't they? Something like that. You got me. Okay. Okay. I like the word. Oh, these are the more recent ones. These and were the backs. Your, well, yeah. 06. 06, okay. Or 07, maybe. So this is, I mean, really playing with border, but... Well, this is like making the inside of the image the outside of the okay. image. So by cutting it, I turned, the ins turned them inside out. And because of the angle of the cut, that determined, at least for me, it determined the outside edge of the paper. Yeah, no, there's a certain logic that comes out of that. You have to do it that <laughs> way. That's right. So if you cut the thing at an angle and you turn it inside out, the, the corner is going to be right. that angle. And then, so, the, of course, the frames have to be odd as well. Yes, and the frames are odd. Fun to make. And they have to be done that way, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> These were here at the fair last time, I think. All right, let's see. We've got to keep moving. All right, etching. Ah, you're in Barcelona with the... Poligrafa. Yeah. Yes. And I always title my Catalan prints in Catalan. I lived in Mallorca briefly, just after school, and... and as a, a kind of a language ophile, I got into to Catalan, and, uh, and it's again, it's a th you know letting the world into into the work doesn't really necessarily mean that much directly. Although this this does translate to um, angry form with teeth 
forma enfadada am dent. Mm -hmm. And then back to this form again. Flechas redones, yeah, rounded arrows. Rounded arrows, I love those. Oh, and the, another sort of unusual, I mean, still a system. You Líneas can ortogonales it, decrescentes. Yeah, orthogonal lines diminishing. Well, that's that four split thing going back to one of the first prints you saw. I know, but the form in which the line the is... The fuzzy, fuzzy arrows. It's unusual. Yeah. Yeah, no, the energy of Catalonia kind of got to me. Ah. La por, fear. So this is obviously the first figurative thing we've seen. I've <laughs> only done a few. I guess I only, yeah, I did, I only, do, only with polygrapha. Um, when people write about me, they kind of conveniently leave this violated part of my work uh, alone, which is fine. I mean, I've, Oh, there is a print. I did a print for benefit WFMU. I don't know if that's in here. I don't think so. But this is a. I, I made some drawings of screaming people and um, old people and penises and vaginas and I, I took those naughty out. things. Oh, look. You can say, I can say penis and vagina. You, you can. Know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just did. So, but, but <laughs> um, they leave that stuff out. And, uh, but the work continues to exist. What can I say? Is that all I could? That's, just leave it there. <sighs> all right, more lithographs. These are from Tamarind, who I'm not sure is here yet, but they'll be here this weekend. Going to keep moving, keep moving, because we're losing time. Oh, yeah, that's the, so those are the sagging grids with the X, right. the lower, mm -hmm. yeah. Here's some combs. Recursive combs, Recursive right. Combs. Oh, God, it's almost 8 o'clock. Ah, and this, look at the size on this, 82 inches tall. It's gigantic and heavy, by the way, in that frame. Yes, it's here this weekend. You all can come see it. So these were these were done at Wash U at Island Press, and with the with the help of some very skilled and um, attentive students, who I taught how to cut using the template method from my old mat cutting days. So I cut an arrow out of cardboard, and then. In order to cut an arrow exactly the same size, you use that arrow to cut all the others with a very sharp blade, and you try not to hop over the edge. And uh, so we could make, so they're all exactly the same size, and that was important to me. So it's funny, you know, you know when I talk about the vagaries of the hand, it's not always the case, but this also allows for the vagaries of the print. So, because the, the white halos around those arrows are caused by the gap between the arrows, uh, the raised arrows that are inked, sitting on an inked uh, surface. So you're inking right. the cut cardboard cutouts. Well, we roller ink yeah. the cut cardboard cutouts, and we swabbed ink on the on the Sintra substrate, and we had little anchor points, and we we laid the arrows against pins and you drop it in place, oh. and then move on, put the pins here, lay another one, drop it in place, and then lay the paper down carefully. Can, this is a good moment to talk about scale, because your things are generally what I would call domestic size. Yes, normal size normal, are for normal, normal size people in normal size houses, <laughs> to quote Tom Neskowski. Yeah. 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 yeah, so suddenly, well, they had a big press, so you had to do it, right? Yeah. I, rules are made to be broken. That's, I mean, I'm getting, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to be here forever. I want to make some different things. Okay. Ah, this is the most recent reduction screen. That's the reduction screen that I did at Wasaic Project last, last summer. Right. Well, I am glad you got that, you know, because it's, you know, I haven't, I, I'm working on some wandering prints that I don't have any proofs to show you yet. So they, they will appear to be wandering off of the plate onto the margin. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yes. yes. All right. So I feel like, oh. So oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't know. I was snapping pictures in your studio. Oh, oh yes. And so uh, then the arrows, of course, caught my eye because I knew the island uh, press Ruth prints. Lingen gave me those arrows. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the great relief printer Ruth Lingen nice. and paper maker. And my bicycle that I built when I was 14, rode yep. across Europe a couple times. And then, but what's behind them? Oh, my typewriters. Yeah, the typewriters. You have a collection, eh? I have a collection, yes. And I just had a fascination with them. I've, I've, I've loved the idea of a machine that comes to life 
with a human hand or a, and a bicycle. It's an interesting That's bicycle right. typewriter. Yeah. They, don't, they really don't do anything until a human being can, gets involved. And, um, and only recently have I done some works involving uh, typewriters, some drawings. And stay tuned for prints, of maybe some letterpress prints. Oh, cool. This is a, um, two s shots from the drawing show at Pace. And I think I have, so here's a wanderer, oh, there's a wanderer on the yeah. left. It's the first wanderer. Yeah. And then the one on the right is a drawing that kind of fascinated me because it's, in general, you're, the images are two-dimensional explorations of you know, some kind of pa pattern. I know you hate that. Yeah, in a kind pattern. of lateral, there's lateral space. <laughs> right, a lateral yeah. space. And then yeah. suddenly these things are kind of MC Escher-esque you know, impossibilities. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're, you know, these three-dimensional things are sitting in this kind of window space versus the kind of expanse of... Well, what I wanted, I wanted to go against compression. I wanted to go against this kind of two-dimensional machine action. And I wanted to activate uh, paper space into architectural space and uh, directly rip off Frank Stella from those fantastic Gemini prints of 1970 that I finally own two of, oh. which I've wanted ever <laughs> since I was a kid. And, um, and I thought, I'm going to steal that. I'm totally going to steal that. And, and I, because I think that's what he was doing. And I wanted to go into it again. And then, of course, as they moved into the corners of the pages, I thought, well, just keep moving off the page. Yeah. Ah, and text. And text, which if I hadn't done these, I, I wouldn't have inflicted that poster on you. <laughs> but uh, I started writing these texts. I mean, I wrote a, I, I did one larger word piece about this big. These, there are 27 of these little tiny ones I did in a Moleskine book. Um, but I did want, do you want me to recite the first one? Yeah, go for it. Oh boy, now I'm going to forget it probably. Let there be nothing right under here. the weight of history's dark I mistakes. The first oh, one. that's the first part. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I went back and made that after. I oh. mean. Uh, and then it's as endless songs echo through the unreasonable heavens. Not nothing, not evil, nor good is a direct result of nature's indifference. Listen, children, to the universe ignoring you. And uh, yeah, other cheerful things came out of that. <laughs> It's hard, you can't, it's hard to be optimistic all the time. This is, this is one of my favorite things in the show at Pace Gallery, that, that he said, I, you know, I really don't want a vinyl sign, and he just took his pencil and drew his name and drawings on the wall, which I thought was great. Thanks. Yeah. That was... And, of course, back to the poster, because I'm, you know, it's a print fair, and you did a poster for us. Thank I you. I did a poster for Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But you have another word thing to tell us about. Oh, I, uh, yes, I received yesterday, overnight from Hong Kong, a, a mystery package. Because uh, in these times of untruths and unreasonableness, I kept thinking the word reality is a really important word. Really important. And I always loved enamel pins. As a kid, I collected them. I thought, Gee, I wonder how much it would cost to get an enamel pin with the word reality on it. Period. The period came a little bit ah, later. Okay. And so here it is. It arrived yesterday. And uh, it's an unlimited edition. And they are on sale directly from me <laughs> for between 5 and $10. Whatever you want to pay, I will put all the money back into making more pins. With more important words. With more words, reality right. on them. Exactly. Or maybe some other single words. The next one might be the word science. <laughs> How about just science? Would, you, would, that, would that work? Would also you, important. Would you go for a science? Would you wear a pin that said science? Yes. yes. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I think that that's my last cool. I think that's the last slide. So um, we have time. I think. Let's see. How we do? 8.05. Uh, Morgan is going to grab a microphone over here. She needs to turn it on. It'll blink green and then be solid green and it'll be on. So if anybody has questions, you can actually start without the mic and I'll repeat them for the crowd. Anybody? Anybody? All right. The one where you mentioned Frank Stella, were you talking about the placement on the page? Yes. Yeah, I mean, is it glib to say architectural space? I mean, I, no, I, like it. I, think, it, I think that's what's happening. 
Yeah, and when you move into framing space, something else happens. Because a frame is neither art nor architecture. It's a kind of a bridge between worlds. And, um, and there are others, other drawings that have started making where the shape doesn't look like it's shifted out of the, the confines of the space, but it's, got, it's grown larger or turned 90 degrees or made a circuit around the, the mat. I actually forgot to ask you one question. The, with your paintings, the aluminum never is allowed to show through. It's, you cover the... Not anymore. I showed it a couple times. Did you? Yeah. I, mean, I, had, a, I had a painting with, little cir with four circles, and they radiated these parallel lines. Oh, okay. And I just couldn't think of what to put in them. And my little son, my little at the time son, who was like eight, he said, oh, I know what you should put in there. I said, what? He said, happy faces. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't have the nerve to do that, so, <laughs> so that painting is out there with, with, the, with the metal. But I don't want that kind of fetishy metal thing. I don't, it's metal, it's, they're about paintings, and I think paintings should take responsibility for themselves. You know, they should be completely painted. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. That's my thing. Huh. I believe in that, yeah. Because it's so in contrast with paper, which of course we're all paper people in the audience. And paper is such a gift. Yeah, so when I talk about this in school, I say, you know, there's no problem leaving the beautiful glow of paper. It's like skin. It's like, you know, take advantage of it. You called it sexy in your talk with Chuck. Did I? You did. You said oh, paper is sexy. Paper it's is? like skin. Because it is sexy. <laughs> I was injured, man. I had broken my wrist like a week beforehand. That was a crazy talk. Because I was in a lot of pain. And Chuck showed up with a flask. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Felt no. We poured ourselves a couple scotches and it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any, uh, yeah, Judy. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by this color challenge bit that you have because you're so meticulous in your color checks. So how do you, how do you figure that out? James came to color check the poster to pick the red, the blue, and the yellow that was going on the screen print. And we were sitting there color checking. He's like, and by the way, I'm color blocked. And Kyle, the printer's like, so why did you come? <laughs> <laughs> Bungie jumped to Baltimore. That's Who's going right. to put it down, man? Damn. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't see color. I just see it differently. So you and, have something in your brain, but you're not sure that that's actually what's translating to those of us who are color challenged? I don't think it has to do with the brain at all. It's just a physical disability. I mean, maybe I have to use my brain to outsmart myself or something. I'm not, you know, Tom, I'm going to quote Tom Naskowski again. I guess he was famous, is famous for saying, colors are very good at keeping shapes apart. Yes. <laughs> Which, you know, it's true, but that, la that last print, the Wasaic print, red, yellow, and blue, I mean, I, I, I had this kind of dumb revelation last a couple of months ago, when I because I I drew for like two years with without hardly painting at all. I mean, like three paintings in the last two years, and I'm getting back to painting. And right before I made that print, I'd been thinking about what the colors would be like because I'd taken color out, or color and painting color out for for so long. And I had this, you know, revelation: paintings are about color. Holy crap! I don't know, I, you know, I'm 60 years old. I don't know that. What, how long did it take to figure that out? But, uh, so, you know, I'm, I am going into very, you know, I see those colors. Believe me, I see red, yellow, and blue. I'm, I kind of chose them to be super visible to me. Um, but I also have just a kind of trust in the process. You know, I chose a color recently. I was just... I was running one morning and thinking like, okay, I did the red thing, and what's gonna go inside the red thing? It's next to the yellow and the black thing. And I thought, mint green, of course. You know, and I don't know why, but it just, and I figured out how to make a mint green. It looked really weird to me. I'm painting it, and I'm going, this looks like a kind of pukey gray, brownish, but I know it's mint green, because I know what I mixed. So I know it's going to look different to other people. And I'm painting a dark red in a gouache that's also interacting with a, a, um, a dark brown, like a burnt sienna. 
and I can't really see the difference when I'm not really concentrating. But I'll make a move with each of those because they're going to have to, they also have to, each of those units have to interact with another color. So I'll do something to kind of make it work. I'll think about it a long time before I do it because each time I make a decision like that, it's like, okay, that's two days. So don't, so think, think before you <laughs> think. do it. All right, anybody else or should we call it quits? All right, thank you guys for coming. It's been great having you.